I'm going to read to you the first seven verses. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he said, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. When they came to Jordan, they cut down wood, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Now thank you for standing. You may be seated. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning, preach here for a few moments, and uh, about uh, this story here in the Bible. I have preached from this story some years ago, and I was just uh, looking at some uh, old notes some time back. It's been actually a couple months ago and came across this, and it's just kind of been burning on my heart, and so I thought maybe the Lord would have me to uh, preach it again today or preach some of the thoughts here and, and just look at some of the things, and I even learned a few new things, as I oftentimes do when I get into the Word of God. Thankful that the Word of God is always fresh. Uh, it never gets old, never gets dry. It's a big book, 66 books, 1,189 chapters uh, of that Bible that you have right there. There's a lot of verses and a lot of words and a lot of things and a lot of stories and a lot of truth, and I'll never plumb the half of the depth of all the things that God has. I'm glad there's always new truth, practical truth, and present truth for me from the Word of God. And so I want to get uh, into this portion of Scripture, and I want to talk to you about a three-word phrase that we find in verse number six. Uh, it is the question of verse number six. The question there is, where fell it? Do you see that three-word phrase uh, right about the beginning part of verse number six? Uh, where fell it? Here we have an interesting story in the Bible, of course we know, uh, because the Bible tells us who the story is centered around. It is centered around the great uh, prophet by the name of Elisha. Elisha uh, would be the, uh, the prophet after the great Elijah. Uh, Elijah, of course, that uh, great man of God, and, and uh, Elisha uh, was anointed to be the next prophet after Elijah had gone through some deep and dark days in his life, and, and uh, he anointed Elisha, and and uh, he asked Elisha, what would you like uh, to have? And Elisha said, I just want to have a double portion of what God has given to you. And Elijah said to him, if you see me when, I'm go when I go, he said, you'll have that double portion. Man, uh, what I like about that story, not preaching that this morning, but I like the fact in that story that Elisha stayed as close to the man of God as he could get because he didn't want to miss the moment because Elijah never told him when he was going to go. And he wasn't going to miss that opportunity to have that blessing of God on his life. Boy, I think you ought to stick close to the man of God so that we have the blessing of God in life. You say, you say that just because that you are the man of God. I don't say that because I'm the man of God. I may not be the man of God for Calvary Baptist Church next week. I may not be the man of God and wherever God will take you next. I think you ought to just stick close to the man of God, to the people of God, and those, I guess I'll broaden it, that are walking with God so that I may have the blessing of God on my life. Uh, and he just said, just stay here until I go. And boy, Elisha was there when the chariot came and it caught old Elijah away. And, and Elisha was there and God would bless him in his ministry. And so here he comes to uh, uh, this point in his life. And the Bible says here that, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm really going to only talk about verses 5 and 6. But if we go into the story, you see in verse number 1 that the sons of the prophets and this is nothing more than what we might think of in the Bible as Bible college. They're just starting a Bible college. And, uh, and they say that uh, the place is too straight. In other words, there's, there's not enough room for us here. And uh, we need to go and we need to build some other place. Verse number two, let us go. And the, the verse number two is very important. Verse number three uh, uh, into the text, let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. And watch what the verse says here. I want you to keep this thought in mind. And take thence every man a beam. Keep that phrase in mind as we uh, get into the text. And let us make a place uh, there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. 
And so they've come to Elisha, and they've said, we need a bigger place uh, that we can build a Bible college. And, and so here's all these men. And I want you to just imagine this in your mind. Here they all are, and they've come to the man of God, and they've said, we want to go and build this, this building, this place where we can live and we can study uh, and we can learn and we can use it as a place to go out and to preach uh, uh, and to teach and to prophesy. They were the prophets of those days. And so Elisha, they've come to him, they've said, every one of us will do our part. Every one of us. Isn't that what the text said? He said, every one of us will do our part, Brother Jeff. And so Elisha says to them, well, go ahead. In the very next verse, you would find that they came to Elisha, and they said, what in fact, one of them said, be content, verse number three, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And so Elisha wasn't planning on going. But they said, boy, we'd like to have Elisha. We'd like to have the man of God with us on this journey. And uh, by the way, that's going to work out to their benefit a little later on in the story. And maybe, just maybe, I don't know this to be the case, and I don't want to infer something in Scripture that is not written in the Scripture, but the Bible does say that one of them came to him and said, go with us. And the rest of the story talks about just one individual. Brother Elliot, I don't know, but maybe in my mind, I'm just thinking maybe it's the one that had the axe head. Maybe it's the same one that said to Elisha, why don't you go with us? He just wanted to be around the man of God. And so he said, he said, why don't you, we pray thee, why don't you just go with us? And then Elisha said, hey, why not? I'll just go along and do my part. So that's where we are as we move into the story here in verse number four. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. The very first thing I want you to see in verse number five is I want you to see the concern. Look at verse number five. But as one, so again, we have an individual here, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And, uh, and you would find here uh, in this verse that he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Very quickly this morning, look at the concern. Now you say, Preacher, where are you going with this story? Well, the Bible says here, the phrase that we read is, Where fell it? And so I want you to imagine with me, uh, and I noticed this in verse number five, and kind of like the Sunday school hour, I've got lots of notes and lots of things going through my mind. I'll, I'll just give them to you as the Holy Spirit uh, has me to. I noticed something in verse number five as we develop the thought of the concern. I noticed something in verse number two that I had you to key in on. Notice the phrase, take thence every man a beam. And then you notice in verse number five, but as one was felling a beam. Do you know what I wrote down in my Bible just because this is what the Holy Spirit showed me? I hope this, this may help you. Maybe the rest of the message, it won't help you. But I hope this one simple little thing will help you. It is individual responsibility. Did you notice the individual responsibility in your Bible? Don't miss the simplistic. You know, we want to get into the Bible, and we always like to get out the deep things of God. And I like that stuff. You know, we start talking about revelation, inspiration, and this morning we got into some things, and, and they might be a little bit heavier than just the simple, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of simple truth in the Bible, and a great simple truth you'll get from that text is each and every child of God has an individual responsibility. He said, every here they, these guys got together, and if I were to... And get, sort of put together a group of guys. I, I grab Brother uh, Elliot and I grab Brother Norm and I grab Brother Jeff and sort of use these guys right here. And I say, all right, guys, let's all go over to this place and let us uh, let's build a house. And now every one of us uh, in the building of this house is going to have to do his part. Every one of us is going to have to contribute to the construction. That's why the Bible says, let every one, uh, that's an individual thing, let every one of us take a beam. And then you come to that verse and you see, as one was felling, don't add anything or take away from the word of God, but will you allow me to just place something in there? As one was felling his beam. That's what it says, that's what the Bible says there, right? As one was felling a beam. He was doing what they had set out to do, Brother Jeff. He was doing his individual part in the work of God. Do you know that you have an individual responsibility in the work of God? Every single person here has a responsibility into the work of God. It is not just the pastor's job to build the church. It is not just the pastor's wife's job to build the church, or the deacon's wife, or 
or, or this person, or the bus ministry. Every single part, uh, every single person is a part uh, of the body of believers of the Calvary Baptist Church, if I can put it that way. Maybe you're a member somewhere else. But you, sir, you, ma'am, you, young person, have an individual responsibility to do your part. In other words, Brother Norm cannot fail a beam and take care of my beam. He's got to take care of his beam. Any more than I can do, uh, listen, Brother Norm sort of takes care of the ushers around here. Just to make it real simple for you to understand, he takes care of the ushers. We talked about these things on Sunday night, if you were here, about our individual responsibility, amen, and how we need to be in our place at the appointed time, doing what God and what the church and what we have said that we would do. He sort of takes care of the ushers. Listen, I can't handle the ushers and pastor and pray. I can handle the ushers and pastor, but I can't handle the ushers and preach and try to do this and try to be here. I can only be in one place at one time. I can't be back there putting the ushers together and be standing up on the platform getting ready to greet you, getting ready to preach a sermon. I can't be up here preaching to you right now and downstairs working the nursery. Hey, I'm a multitasking machine. Right now, I am doing at least four other things other than preaching. Now, you don't know what any of the four other things are, but they're up here and they're getting done. I mean, I'm building the house. Uh, I'm doing something. That you say, you're not very concentrated on preaching right now. No, I, I'm a multitasker. I can do, I mean, look at, I'm walking and waving my arms and preaching, and probably spitting on the front row or second row at least a little bit. So I know I'm doing at least more than one thing, Brother Jack. Amen. Uh, but I, I can multitask, but in all honesty, I cannot preach to you and work in the nursery. Amen. You don't want me working in the nursery. Ain't no man working no nursery, Calvary Baptist Church. They want to do that in other churches, that's fine. That may work for them. I'm not going to be critical of them, but that ain't happening at the Calvary Baptist Church. That is a place for the ladies. Amen. Well, you're a chauvinist, then I'm a chauvinist. You say, well, ladies belong in the nursery. Ladies belong in the Calvary Baptist Church nursery. You can do whatever you want to anywhere else you want to, but as long as I pastor this church, ladies, you are working the nursery. Amen. Oh, and somebody, wait, is there something wrong with some of you guys? Is your wife holding your tongue this morning? Some of you ought to say amen. I mean, I ought to get a couple of men to say amen on that, or I'm going to start putting you in the nursery amen. to be attended to by those women because you're being babies right now. I can't do that. And so look, those ladies have an individual responsibility. I can't be teaching junior church. I can't be here. I can't be there. Hey, listen, I can't knock every block of every neighborhood that we go to. Oh, I can't go take me a long time. But we all have an individual responsibility as one was failing to be. If you would understand in the body of Christ and in the work of the Lord that you have an individual responsibility, it will help you when you come to this portion of your life. So now watch. There's the individual responsibility he is very, very concerned about doing his duty, Brother Norm. That's the point I'm trying to make. Everybody else is doing their part. And now we have a guy here, and he is chopping down his tree. He is doing his job. He is in the prescribed place doing what he is supposed to be doing. He is he's going to take his beam. You're not going to build that Bible college. You're not going to build that building and there's going to be one log missing. And we're going to say, whose is it? His. I put mine in. He put his in. He put his in. Yeah, but half a roof truss is missing. Now the roof leaks. Brother Jack built, built stuff for a lot of years, built a lot, a lot of big motels and homes and stuff all over the country, big stuff. Did you ever leave out just like a roof truss every once in a while, just go, man, we don't need it. There's plenty of other ones up there to carry the load. First of all, the inspector would have a problem with that. I was recently involved in an inspection process, and, uh, and man, an inspector came in. He said, oh, I don't like them roof trusses. Something don't look right up there. We got to call in a professional. There's a piece of wood up there that doesn't look right. I'm thinking, man, it's a stinking piece of wood. Who cares? Well, we just don't know. I said, what's there to know? And it's wood. It's wood on wood. That thing looks pretty solid to me. Oh, I don't know if it's solid. I said, well, what do you know? He said, well, I know my job, and you don't know my job. I said, well, I guess you kind of got me there. But you know what? If he doesn't do his part, now we got a big open hole. So here he is. He wants to do his part. He's chopping away. 
I notice the concern in this verse. What's the concern that is in this verse? Well, as he is felling the beam, the axe head fell into the water. He's chopping down the tree, and off goes the axe head. So many today are chopping with nothing more than an axe handle. Can I give you a kind of an illustration? What do you mean by that? If I, I wish I had this morning an axe handle. I, I have an axe at home. Uh, I was afraid to bring it into church. One of you might use it on me. <laughs> and I was going to put some wood up here and actually have somebody chop it, but I thought, mm, I'm too OCD, and that'll get wood chips all over the place, and then I'll be driven crazy by that. And, and, uh, and then I'm not going to take the axe head off of the axe handle. And then I, I thought about all of the guys that work with me and helping me set up the tent in various places, and it's none of the guys that go with me. Uh, it's usually in the churches I go to how many sledgehammer handles they break. The sledgehammer handles are not really too much cheaper than a sledgehammer. They, they tell you a, a handle about as much as it is for a whole stinking hammer anymore, and, uh, and every time a guy breaks one, I want to take the handle, and I want to beat the stinking life out of the dude that just broke it. I'm like, why are you hitting the stake with the handle, man? There's a stinking 10-pound head on the end of that thing. Why are you hitting it with the handle and breaking it? You say, do you, do you talk like that to guys? Not sometimes. Let me just put it that way. My man, only the, only the guys I love. But just imagine me this morning with an axe, or imagine me, I just get in my mind a sledgehammer. Now, can you imagine this morning, and, and I've seen this happen, but can you imagine this morning if I had two guys up here? And I mean, your, your, your imagination is good enough to do this. But I can imagine this morning that we have a guy over here, and he has an axe, or he has a sledgehammer, and, uh, and he is a swinging that thing, and you're watching him swing it, and boy, and you're seeing things take place, but you're watching that handle move, right? Chop, chop. And I want you to imagine over here, you got a guy doing the exact same thing. Now, he doesn't have an axe head on the end. He's just got a stick. He's just got the handle. Now, for your purposes, those would almost look like the same thing. As a matter of fact, from a distance, you may not even know the difference, Brother Norm. Why? Well, because the action, I mean, you hang out with those guys of us, and, and, uh, and they know Brother, Brother Elliot and uh, Brother Jack and Brother Jeff and Brother Short is part of our crew now. And boy, we, we put that tent up the other day, had to go through some concrete. Brother Jeff, I don't know how many times he swung that sledgehammer. All I know is Brother Elliot drove 10 stakes. Your preacher drove 10 stakes. Brother Jeff drove one. And he had more sweat than 10 guys on him. He went through at least three shirts, four bottles of water, 16 breaks. I mean, we had to almost call it EMS. It took us as long to drive 20 as it did him to drive one. And when we finished, he was still working. He was going through concrete. There was concrete underneath the grass in this place. But you know what? Watch Brother Elliot with the sledgehammer. He's pretty good with the old sledge. Man, he gets that thing and he gets it moving. Now, if I put a uh, just a handle and uh, maybe Brother Jeff's hand, get them both out there, get them to swing. And I'm not really maybe that, that paying attention. You know, I might not think anything of it. I'll think, well, they're both working. Now, I will hear the ching, you know, of the hammer hitting. But we're talking about cutting down trees. They're, they're not all standing next to each other. Are you with me this morning? Have I bored you out? Are you with me? Come, I mean, wake up a little. Be alive in church a little. I'm trying to get an illustration going here. Listen, you'll think that something's getting done. Here's Brother Elliot, man. He's whacking away. Chop, chop. And boy, you hear this. And here's Brother Jeff. He's over here. He's got nothing but a handle, but he's a hitting a tree. And so you're here now, and the, you're seeing both guys are swinging. But now, wait a minute. One of them is getting something done, and the other one isn't. But they're both pretending one of them is pretending like he's getting something done like the other guy, but the fact of the matter is, is you don't know. They're both swinging away. But one of them's accomplishing something, and one of them is not. So here he is. He's a swinging at this tree, and all of a sudden, that axe head flies off that thing. But I've seen it happen, by the way. I've not just seen sledgehammers break. I've seen sledgehammer, the, the hammer end come off. Man, it's scary. That thing, I mean, especially if you're on a downward, that thing will whoop, you know, shoot off of there, go flying towards somebody. Uh, you say, do you scream when they do that? I never do. I see if it's going to hit them and uh, see what kind of damage I can do with that thing. Uh, but, I mean, I've seen it happen. Man, it happens just like that. And you, there's nothing you can do. 
I mean, you've been coming down with that, and boy, that thing will let loose and pop right off of there. Man, what happened? Well, this thing pops off. It flies into the water. But you know what? Now let's make it spiritual. A lot of people nowadays are chopping with just an axe handle, Brother Jeff. They're getting through life thinking you're filled with the Spirit, when in reality, you've lost the, the axe head. Let's just... Let's just put a representation of the Scripture because I think it's here. Uh, typology in Scripture is a good thing to study. And I just think that we can imagine this morning that you would be the handle, but the Spirit would be the axe head. That's a good illustration. That makes sense. Because you don't get anything done without the Spirit. That's in the Bible. All right? And we got to walk in the Spirit. we got to be filled with the Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit's help. So I'm talking to believers this morning. I, I'll talk to lost people in just a minute because that's here in the text also. But, I mean, if you're saved today, you represent that handle. But to get the tree down in your life, to get the power of God, you got to listen to fellow tree. you got to have some type of power. Where's Brother Zach at? Brother Zach, did he, did he quit church already? Did we upset him? I don't know where he's at. He was here a little while ago, but... He, he, he knocks down trees for a living, and uh, he trims trees, and, and they don't use axes anymore. He uses a chainsaw, but listen, it'd be a hard for him, even with a dull chainsaw, to get anything done. But let's take the blade off, let's take the chain off of that thing. It might have sound real noisy. Man, he's getting a lot done over there. You won't see anything happening. So you're a handle, but you need the power of the Holy Spirit, that's that axe head, to get your work done. But sometimes we go through life or we reach points in our life when, guess what? The axe is not present. The power is not there. Maybe they don't realize it. Maybe you don't even realize it. Or how about this? Maybe, and this is where I think a lot of people are. I pray no one's like this in the room, but I fear someone is like it because the Lord has me preaching this. I think some people are just not concerned, Brother Jeff, that this is where they are in their life. Why? Because they won't admit to it. Now listen, you come to church. You go through the motions and you look uh, like you're doing all right. Yeah, axe handle looks pretty good when it's flying through the air. It looks like everything else. But the fact of the matter is, is you're missing the power of God in your life. It's a representation of the Laodicean church age. The Laodicean church in Revelation chapter number 3, he said, he said, you've got everything. He said, you don't even realize that you're poor, you're miserable, you're blind, and you're naked. He said, but you have everything. You got nice buildings. You got air conditioning. You got carpet. You got chairs. You got vehicles. You got a dollar in your pocket. You say, I don't have much money. All right, you got a dollar. You were able to come to church today. You probably ate a meal in the last week. At least one, probably in the last 24 hours, maybe you ate one. You might not eat three a day. I'm not saying we all got all kinds of money. Nobody like that around here. I'm just saying we're all blessed of God. We live in the United States of America. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we, 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 we're here this morning. We've got everything necessary, and we look good. But without the power of God, we're nothing but just an axe handle. That's the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church is not a building. It's made up of the people that are within it. And if this church is made up of people that are just an axe handle, what are we going to get done? There's the concern. Can I help you with what you ought to do? There's a confession. Look at his confession. And he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Here's this confession. By admitting it was gone, listen, he may be admitting the fact that it had become loose. Brother Jeff, I know that many a time, and I know I'm picking on you this morning, but I know that many a time I've been swinging that sledgehammer, or I have picked up, I have five or six or ten in that tent trailer, and I've worked with other tools before, a shovel or something, and sometimes you pick it up, and I'd pick up a sledgehammer, and I'd feel that that head would be a little bit loose. I wouldn't give that to, say, someone that's working with me, but I'd say I can control that thing because it's loose, and I've been swinging a sledgehammer for a lot of years and try not to do it too much anymore, but uh, I've been swinging that sledgehammer for a lot of years. I know how to handle that thing when it gets a little bit loose. Uh, I'm thinking that when that axe head got loose, that guy knew. He, he noticed that it was, feel, you know, it begins to wobble around on the end of that head a little bit. You can feel it. Usually you can feel it. 
You know, by admitting that that axe, handle, that axe head is gone, you know what he's admitting? I felt like something wasn't right in my life. I, I felt like I was drifting away from God a little bit. I felt like I was spending a little too much time on and you just plugged something in in your mind right now if you're not walking with God the way that you should be. You just thought about exactly. You finished the phrase I didn't need to. Hmm? I felt like I wasn't reading my Bible as much. I felt like I wasn't being as attentive in church and I wasn't as active and engaged in the things of God and I, I felt myself slipping. Well, I can help you with that. We see the concern, but we see the confession, and he may be admitting to the fact, maybe he's admitting to the fact that he's chopped with an axe handle a while so that others would not know what happened. Maybe he went a couple of swings at that thing, and he'd probably already cut into that tree a little bit, and, and uh, he said, you know, if I just keep whacking away over here at this thing for a little bit, nobody will really know that there's anything missing. I can kind of get away with this for a while, but listen, I'm going to tell you something. You'll only get away with that for a little while. And not only does God know, but other people will begin to notice. Because what about when we start hearing, hey, Timber, hey, watch it, hey, one's coming your way. Boy, there would be guys moving out of the way. Hey, in that situation, when everybody else has got a tree on the ground, it's going to be revealed that he didn't have an ax head. They're going to come over and be like, man, what's been taking so long, bud? We've got to have yours to finish the project. We've got to have your input. We've got to get this thing done here. Are you with me? I mean, we've got to get this done. And yet, where's yours? And all of a sudden, you'd have to say, well, I've been over here for the last couple hours just uh, chopping with this. What? Man, where's your axe head at? Well, I lost it several hours ago, but I don't want you guys to know about it. Be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your loss of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, you, you tell us, preacher, you can't lose the Holy Spirit. You can't lose the Holy Spirit. He's in you, but you can grieve him. You can grieve him. You can lose his power in your life. In other words, you can have him, but not be using him and not be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about all this goofy stuff that charismatics and all this other stuff. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about just having the power of God in your life and seeing something done for the cause of Christ and, and having a relationship with God. But you're swinging away and everybody else is working. And you know what? When everybody else is working and your axe head is missing, nobody's going to notice. You know why? Because everybody else is busy. You know, I'm not... I'm not just looking around for everybody's axe head that's missing, Brother Jeff. I'm not over here going, oh, yeah, look at him, no axe head. Oh, look at him, boy, he's missing his. How am I going to be doing that if I'm over here trying to fell my tree? Hmm? But eventually, eventually, it's going to come out. So here he is. He's admitting the fact that maybe he knew it was coming loose and he didn't do anything. Maybe he's admitting the fact that, hey, the thing fell off, it flew off, and I kept uh, working, and I didn't even know. I, I mean, I knew, but I just, I just kept working because I didn't want anyone to know. We must be honest if we're going to get what we lost back. I don't have the fire I once did, preacher. I'm not as close to the Lord as I once was, preacher. By the way, you don't need to say it to me. I'm not, as close to the, I'm not as close to you as I once was. I don't have that fire that I once had. So I'm not struggling with that, preacher. Never been there before, preacher. If that's your story, you're probably there right now. Because those that think that they're perfect are not nearly as perfect as they think that they are. Just be careful. I'm not saying, boy, we ought to walk around, boy, all down all the time and all upset. No, I got no power, God. I can't get anything done for God. Grow up. Did you miss that sermon when I preached about grow up? Was that last week or two weeks ago or two months ago? I think it was last, it was last week. I got a text message, by the way, about last week's sermon. So thank you for preaching that, man. That was good. Amen. I said, praise the Lord for that. That was just somebody that was visiting with us. But you know what? We don't have to walk around like that, but we do every once in a while need to admit the fact that we have to have a little concern, a little confession. And there's a comprehension here in this verse also because look at what he said. The story is very important. And he sa and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. 
There's a comprehension in the scripture. They did not have Home Depot. Brother Scott, there was no Lowe's, no TSC, my home away from home sometimes. If you work for TSC, don't be offended at me right now, but I can't stink and stand that TSC and I go there at least once a week. They never have anything I ever stinking need. I hate that store. And yet they always have, they get some of my money about every week. You want to know why? They never have what I need, but they always have something I want. <laughs> Craziest thing in the world, man, I go in there looking for a bolt. Now you'd think that, that store would have a bolt. They got two stinking aisles full of bolts. Do they have the bolt I need? Of course not. But they did have that cord, that extension cord that I need, wanted. They did have that wrench that I didn't really need, but I might need it next week. And it was on sale. And so I was going to go in and spend 50 cents. And instead I walked out and spent $50. It's a win-win for them. I think they must plan that way to not have what we really need and just have the things that we want. But you know what? If I lost an ax head while I was chopping down a tree out here, I might be able to run down to that TSC and find an ax or an ax head. I might be able to. Maybe. If not, I'll bet you within about 15 minutes, uh, Brother John, I could probably drive somewhere and find what I was looking for. They didn't have that back then. They're out in the middle of nowhere. Hey, if you lost something, there was no source. Are you with me? For getting it back. Now, so if we think about ourselves as that axe handle and we think about the axe head as the Spirit of God, we realize in the Scripture that he has lost something that he has no other source to get back. The power of the Holy Spirit. It's not there. And furthermore... He didn't have any money to replace or to pay for that that he had lost, for it was borrowed. It was not even his own, and he had got it from somebody else, and so he didn't have something that he could just replace it with. If he did, why did he borrow it? Maybe he could just replace it with something else. Huh? He could say, hey, I took your axe head, and I appreciate you giving me axe, your axe head, and I know that what you do for a living is you cut down trees. So I'll tell you what I'll do for you. Instead of that axe head, I will uh, instead, uh, I will give you a set of bowls. I mean, a nice set of bowls. I'll give you a nice set of dishes for your wife. Uh, I'll tell you what. Instead of the axe head, um, I know you cut down trees for a living. You know what? That was crazy of me. I, I should have thought a little more outside the box than that. I'll give you a shovel. You can dig trees down for a living. Preacher, where are you going with this? What we try to do is we try to replace what we've lost with something else. Well, I'll just get busy at work. Oh, preacher, that's not any of your business. It might not be, but it is the Holy Spirit's business, so let me speak on his behalf. If you are not busy in the work of God and finding yourself busy in the work of man, too busy to work for God, you're too busy. You're too busy. You need to make time for God. You want to know why? Because you've lost something, and you don't want to admit that you've lost it. You just want to pretend like everything's all right. And so I'm going to replace the axe head with this over here. It's not yours. It's borrowed. And now what you're trying to do is replace that with something else, and that ain't going to work. Because what you did not have in the beginning that you now have is a blessing. And when you do not have that anymore, you ought to think that's a crisis. So he said, I don't have anything else to do. I don't know. It's a borrowed piece. And what am I supposed to do? Do you know that you do not operate in your own power? Acts 1 and verse number 8 says, And ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Did you know that's in your Bible? What you have is the Holy Spirit, and he's given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's not yours. Amen. For the Bible says, ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. And what you have in the power of the Holy Spirit is a borrowed source, and how dare you let something go that is not yours. If I loan you my car and you come back to me and say, you know what, I lost your car. What do you mean you lost my car? 
well, I had it and I just don't know where it went. You say, well, I would never do that. That's a car. Yeah, and you think the Holy Spirit is uh, <laughs> less important than a car or more important than a car? I, I, I dare say you get through life without a car, but you have a hard time getting through life without the Holy Spirit of God. You know how I can prove that? Brother Jeff, we went to Africa. How many people did we know that had cars in Africa when we were out in the bush? Oh, that's right, none. But a lot of them had the Spirit of God on them. And they were operating just fine without cars. They were operating just fine without cell phones. They were operating just fine without the Internet and without video games and without this, that, and the other thing. Boy, preacher, you do preach about everything. I do. I offend myself much more than I offend you, I promise. And I don't even play video games. Oh, my word. No, I stopped wearing my short pants a long time ago. Oh, boy, did I meddle right there. Uh, yeah. Uh, when I was a man, I put away childish things. Amen, preacher. Verse number six, moving along quickly in the text. Uh, and the man of God said, where fell it? Where fell it? So we see the concern, the confession, the comprehension. Now, here's the coming back. Jordan represents, and this is important, listen here, Jordan represents the old life. You know any time in the Bible that, uh, I, I could take you to places in the Bible, but remember Naaman in chapter number five, just one chapter back, uh, he is told to go and he comes to Elisha, or he actually, yeah, he comes to Elisha and he wants to be healed of leprosy. And where's Naaman tell him, go to the Jordan River? He says, are there not other rivers that are clean? I had old, dirty Jordan River. It represents an old life. That's what that Jordan is. Remember the Jordan River, the children of Israel had to cross out of the wilderness, cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land. You know what they were doing? They were leaving the old life behind. The old Jordan River is representation of the old life. And isn't it funny how in this text, he said, where fell it? Oh, it's down there. I, I, I lost what I lost. Look at it. And he showed him the play, or I'm sorry, it was a uh, last master. And the man of God showed him, where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Verse number two, let us go unto Jordan. So you see here, they're at the Jordan. They got to leave behind. You and I got to leave. What we do is we lose what God has given us in the old life again. The old life sort of creeps up at us. And so here is the coming back. And uh, the children of Israel, just like they had to cross it, and just like Naaman, uh, he said, where'd you lose it? And I see the, con the confrontation. Look at the confrontation here. Verse number six, and he showed him a place, and he cut down the stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Did you notice that? He goes, where'd you lose it at? So there's the coming back. You know what? You want, to, you want to know how to get back what you lost? Go back to the place where you lost it. You know where you lost it. Go back to the place where you lost it. Go back to the place where you were. The Spirit of God, I mean, He was, he was working in you, and you were working for Him, and you were not perfect, but you were walking hand in hand, and you know the place where you got out of step. You know that thing that you did. You know that place where you just said, you know what, I'll just do this for a while, and I'll just be over here for a while. Go back to that place and just admit to the fact, that's the place where I lost it. And then watch what he said. He said, that's where I lost it. He knew exactly where it was. He knew. He heard the plump. And he looked up and he went, uh-oh, it's in the deep water now. You got to wonder why you just didn't go over there, Brother Norm. It must not have been like two or three inches, in, inches deep. Why he just didn't go over there, reach his hand, didn't pull that thing out? It must have been deeper. Maybe he couldn't swim. He realized whatever it was, I tell you this, he realized he couldn't do it on his own. He could not get to it. He could not see it. By the way, the Jordan River was a dirty river. That's why Naaman said, are there not better rivers? Are not this river and that river and that old filthy Jordan River? Yeah, that's what the old life is. It's filthy and dirty. And that old axe head went down in there and he said, I can't even see it. I don't even know where it is. And I'm not about to jump in all that muck and mire and try to swim around it. Maybe I can't even swim and it's over my head and I can't get to it and there's nothing I can do and that's when the man of God says there's a stick that can we can throw in that filthy water and it will help and that reminds me of the cross 
You gotta get back to the cross. Get back to that place where you receive the Holy Spirit of God. You got to get the cross back in your life, and we got to get Christ back in our life. And it's not really so much as about the cross, but that stick is a tree. Get back to the cross and remember what took place on the cross of Calvary. And then the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And every once in a while, Christian, we got to go back to Calvary and remember what Jesus did for us. And we get so far away and we get wrapped up in ourselves and we forget the goodness of God and we're so far away and wrapped up in the world and we Holy Spirit of God's not even working in us anymore but we're just swinging away with that old axe head and every once in a while in your life you just need to go back to the cross and back to the Savior and back to Christ and remember what He did for you that will change your outlook Amen. that's what it took in His life you realize there's a representation there in the Scripture of a lost person? You're, you're, you're sunk in the mire and the filth of the Jordan River in the old life, uh, and you need someone to get you out, and it took, look at it, a man of God. Uh, it took someone, how shall they hear uh, unless they be sent, or how shall they be sent, or how shall they hear unless they be sent? And, and the Bible says in Romans, I think it is uh, chapter number 10, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, and, uh, and they've got to have the Word of God. That's the man of God, the representation there and you need the gospel to get you out of that mire and out of that old life and out of that Jordan River. Yeah, you need someone. And it takes a stick. It takes a tree. It takes the cross. Concluding, the last thing in the verse, or the last thing in the chapter, verse number seven, therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. There is commitment. There is commitment. Do you understand here what goes on in the Scripture? As a matter of fact, if you look at verse number 6, can I just give you something a little practical, a little devotional? And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did float. You got the wrong Bible. The Bible says the iron did Swim. Now, swimming, I looked up the word swim. I do not swim. I don't float. I do none of the above, but I sink really well. You say, yeah, and you're a little guy. How do you do that? I don't know. It just happens. I don't like swimming. Don't like, I like boats. I like being on top of the water. I just don't like being in it. All right? Showers are fine. Baths are for girls. Somebody say amen right there. All the men in the room ought to say amen right there, all right? Uh, and, uh, and all his, I really am a male chauvinist, I think, a lot of the time, Brother Jeff. Uh, I'm starting to think that about my own self. Uh, but uh, no. Uh, anyways, uh, I mean, but I looked up the word swim in a Webster's 1828 dictionary, and in one of the definitions, it does say float, but I want to tell you something. Watch this. A dead body floats. A dead body floats. That's not dead. That's swimming. Now, I don't know if it was doing the backstroke or the breaststroke or if it was doing the dip and dive, whatever they call that thing. I don't know what kind of swimming it was doing, but my little messed up mind just imagines that little axe head well, arm over arm in the water. <laughs> I don't know. And all of you are doing that right now, too. And you'll never get that out of your mind. Well, that's all right. It's been in this messed up mind for years. Every time I read swimming, I see that little axe head just a swimming, just a swimming in the water. Oh, somebody go down and get him. He's so cute. Uh, but there it is, right? I mean, that thing is swimming. It's not swimming away. If it were floating, it'd be caught with the current and swept downstream. That's what that, a dead body would do that, right? Hmm? It's just maintaining its place right there. Why? Because it's alive. That's crazy. And he said, you ready? Here's your part. You got to commit. How many of you think that the man of God, because of that power that was displayed right there, 
could have taken the stick, thrown it in, that thing could have jumped out, jumped back on the end of his stick. This is the man of God. He raised, by the way, a dead, dead person. Okay. He could have reached over for him. He could have grabbed it. He could have said, give me your ax handle. He could have stuck it back on the end of it for him. Go, there you go, man. You're all set again. He could have made the end of that ax handle just reappear on the end of that. He could have done a hundred different things. Did you notice what he did? He threw that stick in. They're both standing there. And all of a sudden, boop, man, up comes that thing. And it's just sitting right there. And it's within reach. He didn't have to get in the water. He didn't have to get all messed up in the muck and mire, and he didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to throw himself down and beg and squalor and carry on. What did he have to do? He had to commit to just reaching in right in front of him. It's that easy. He just had to commit to reach down. You know what that's called? It's a five-letter word called faith. Just reach down and pick it up. If you're lost, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're the dead body. But by faith, you can take hold of the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, the cross of Calvary, and you can be brought to life. If you're away from God and you're whacking away, would you admit this morning we're fell it? It's right over there. And here's the Holy Spirit right now. Here's Jesus Christ. He said, look at that thing swim. What do I need to do? Reach down and pick it up. Just make the commitment. Say, you know what? I've gone to the place where it was. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to put it back on the end of that handle, and I'm going to get busy for God. Because the day is far spent, and the night cometh when no man can work. And I don't know how much longer that you and I think that we've got on this side of eternity, but I can promise you on the authority of the Word of God, I read about it in the book of Timothy, know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own self. I wonder if we've seen that anywhere. Shall be heady, high-minded, traitors, uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Huh? Disobedient. Disrespectful. All that stuff is in your Bible. I wonder if we see any of that stuff. Go home this afternoon, turn on any one of the news channels. They're all communistic in their uh, thinking, by the way. Turn on Fox or CNN or, or some local news channel, and you will find all those things taking place. You want to know why? Know this also, that in the last day, perilous times shall come. You and I are living in the last day. And it is what... But I think that any moment the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to call us out of here. I mean, we're getting out of this place, but we better work because the night is coming when no man can work. And, and the longer we go at this thing, more darkness prevails. Amen. I appreciate the freedom that we have in America. I appreciate the, the, that for, for whatever, you know, under what is going on now that we do have uh, Christianity. I mean, it's seeming like it, it's not quite being as uh, fought against, even though I'm not even sure that's the case. I think that's probably an untruth too, but it just seems like we can at least do what we're doing. But I'm going to tell you right now, it ain't going to last long. This thing's about to change. And it's going to be dark. Right now, you have an opportunity to work. Let's get to work. Or swing around with your handle. Because you're impressing everyone. But there's a beam missing right here. And there's a beam missing right there. And there's a beam missing right there. And Brother Jack, I'm not a builder, but I'm not thinking that roof's going to hold. If I took out a couple of legs of your chair, would you have sat in it this morning? But we try to do it in the Christian life. Lord, this morning we come to the close of this service.